as we've been in our story series, uh, just uh, I truly believe, and not just believe it, but I've I've gotten testimony of testimonies, like people contacting me and uh, letting me know how the stories are helping them, and and they're sharing it with their friends and their families. And God just kind of dropped this in our spirit a, a while back, is to is to go back to that Revelation 12, 11, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And I just got to the point, I was talking to the team, I said, I said, I feel like there's some other voices that can that can speak and share something that, that can bless people other than my voice all the time. And so we just hit this series and and uh, it's really, it's, it's kind of like the Church of Acts, walking out what they do in the Bible, uh, sharing, encouraging, and uh, so today we have with us Lisa Segelski going to be sharing her story uh, of her daughter Lauren and as a, as a mother of, of walking her through uh, the brokenness and the pain and the addiction and as a mom trusting God with all that, Lisa, uh, I believe that what you share today, that there's somebody in this room or somebody that's watching that they're going to be able to identify with parts of your story that they can apply to their life and find hope and strength to still keep moving forward. And so uh, before you start talking about Lauren, I want you to give us some background of your daughter, uh, Lauren, and just how she was and kind of take us on the backstory, and then I'll go from there. But you definitely need that microphone. <laughs> Hello. Can y'all hear me? They have cut me off already. I'm on? Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. All right. I got you now. All right. right Joseph, okay. everything good back there? All right, here we go. There's just this one part here that uh, I did write down, and I want to make sure I articulated it correctly, so I am going to read this. The rest of our talk will be uh, off, the off the cuff, okay? So, um, really, actually, I wanted to start, if I could, in Isaiah 61. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, just turn to Isaiah 61. This has always been my life scripture and something that God has repeatedly over the years brought me back to over and over as I ask him, you know, randomly, well, what is my purpose or what am I here for? So let's read Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild, they meaning us, that would be us. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. That would be those nasty generational curses, right? He's saying that we can... Um, that he would restore that. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. And in the riches, in their riches, you will boast. Instead of your shame, and I really love this part. Because he's saying, you're going to live you've lived through all of this. Now this is what I'm going to give you at the end of all of this. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. And I really love this. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. So I want to start off real quick. My, my prayer, I'm going to just read this a little bit here. My prayer um, has on, obviously has been to honor my daughter, Lauren, Elizabeth, and God. I've struggled the last couple of days thinking about this talk because, you know, my daughter is far more than a cautionary tale to me and to our family. And although she's not the one speaking today, I wanted to make sure the essence of who she was is seen brightly through my words because 
She was not only beautiful on the outside. I think um, Joseph might have a picture. I brought a picture to share so you Josiah, can see. There, you there she is. She had a megawatt smile with those big blue eyes and dimples. And she, I uh, think she won most witty in high school. She was hilarious. She was one of those kind of people, extremely intelligent, would walk in a room and it just changed the, just the air in the room. She was so kind and loving and put others first. She was kind of an errand to a Moses. We have a lot of Moseses in our family. And she was the errand and we thank God for that. Um, she was a sweetheart. So anyway, <clears throat> I don't think I could tell this story without giving you a little little taste of, you know, kind of uh, uh, backstory. But to understand her story, I need to briefly share some backstory. And around the age of 16, while beginning to show some signs of some inner struggle, um, Lauren went to Teen Challenge for a year. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with that, you know, they you spend a lot of time in the Word, and you spend a lot of time in counseling. Um, she began, she was struggling, and she came out while she was there about a trauma she experienced um, a few years earlier. She was sexually and emotionally abused, and um, I believed her, and I stood by her. I was obviously devastated for her and, and supported her with counseling and love and anything that I possibly could. Um, what particularly hurt her was that when she came out about it, instead of being embraced, supported, and the victimizer confronted, a large part of my family rejected her. That would not be my children, obviously, or me, but there was a large part of my extended family that rejected her, shunned her, and even shamed her for saying such things. They didn't speak to her, they didn't reach out to her, they didn't talk to her. Because in a dysfunctional family system, the rule is you don't talk, you don't feel, you don't tell, you don't speak. You shove it under the rug and you move forward, even if there are casualties lying on the road. Um, sometimes you even get ran over while you're laying there. And that happened to her. I don't speak about those family members with malice. I think they were in a place where they were unable to really maybe accept or understand the truth. And so I've had to walk through kind of forgiveness with those hurts there, okay? Um, I applaud uh, Lauren for being courageous nonetheless as she spoke the truth, but however the reper repercussions of what had happened to her clothed her with shame, self-loathing, depression, a poor self-esteem that eroded her value and identity. She began to numb the pain with drinking. And then it got worse. Wow, and wow. that's where I just wanted to share a little yeah, bit absolutely. because I, I, I'm a pretty blunt person, pretty straight up. Um, somebody doesn't drink themselves to death for no reason. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important that you get a little taste of maybe what was going on there. What, what was okay. going on? Yep. Now, you know, you said she went to Teen Challenge. And, yes, she did. Uh, in the midst of that, I believe uh -huh. you, you said oh. something, that she found the Lord. She did. She yeah. got saved at a Joyce Meyer conference. Yeah. So, and so was, during that period, yes. it's like you have an experience with Christ, and you mm -hmm. got saved, and throughout that, something came out of her uh, letting people know, hey, I this happened to me. Correct. And because of the, re the rejection, and not, at least as a mother, how did you feel uh, when your daughter told you that, and then she was rejected by family? What did you do? What did God do for you to help you support her in such a way to, to be a mom and, and to trust God with your daughter? I, I, it was really important that I listened to her, that I validated what she had to say. Um, that I supported her, um, and I prayed for her. I prayed that God would heal her. Being a former counselor that dealt with people with addictions. You, you were Yes, I was a former counselor. Sexual abuse victims, family issues, and substance abuse. I was very, very well aware of w the ramifications of what can happen to somebody. Um, and I knew it was going to be a road for her to walk through. Now, I didn't necessarily share all that with her, <laughs> but I knew it was going to be a road. It's going to be a road, be a, a, journey. Road, a yeah. journey. And so I really tried to encourage her and prayed for her and supported her and um, worked through my own anger and bitterness about what was going on mm -hmm. with what hurt her. Yeah. Because that's a whole thing over there, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 
So as, as you said, things kind of got worse from there, got yes. into addiction, got into mm -hmm. alcohol and drug addiction. And, you know, you were sharing with me how as, as a parent and you've watching your child go through this, uh, what were some of the things that you had to learn or God had to, to teach you as a, as a mom? You, you, you're wanting to love your daughter. You're not loving what she's involved in. Mm -hmm. And so take us on that journey, Lisa, as a mother. What was that like? Uh, dealing with a child that you knew at one point she had an experience with Christ, mm -hmm. but now this this other lifestyle has is dragging her into darkness. Yes. What was what were some of those days and nights like with Lauren loving her in the midst of what she was going through? I think my heart cry to God was was something like the balance between codependency, trying to rescue her and putting boundaries down and staying out of God's way so that she could come to the end of herself so that God could step in. Where is that boundary? Where, where, when do you know? When they are 18, 19, 20 years old and they're moving out of the house and, and they get around people that, that um, they pick the wrong friends. She picked the wrong friends. And she got around people that did drugs. And Lauren's big um, drug of choice, as they say, was alcohol. She liked alcohol and she'd smoke pot, but she stayed away from the heavy stuff there for quite a while. One of the friends that she'd gotten around um, liked pills, and um, so that started going on. But my question to God, when she would move out and, um, you know, she would lose a job because she couldn't wake up on time or she was drunk, um, over the years, it got worse, obviously. She fell deeper into that cycle of addiction. But, um, what, Mom, can I come home? Well, yeah, but you can't drink. You can't drink on Christmas morning and drag your friends to the house and be drunk. You know, that's going to be a problem. You can't do that. Oh, Mom, I promise. Okay, we went through this for about 10 years. You know, back and forth and back in the house, out of the house. And my big worry was if I don't let her stay, if I let her stay, at least I know she's safe. She's not going to be out there driving drunk and hit somebody and kill somebody and maybe go to jail or, or overdose and, and be a quadriplegic or a brain dead. Like all those thoughts go through your mind as a parent. You know, I got to do something. I got to keep her safe. And meanwhile, praying and t speaking the truth to her. And many, many times she'd come back to the house and then over, you know, I promise, I promise. Oh, yeah, no. Um, and she would... Uh, you know, we'd go into the bedroom when she was gone to work or something, cleaning up, and literally, I can't count how many times the green garbage bags, you know, the big, big leaf garbage bags full of vodka bottles and beer that we pulled out from underneath her bed and in the closet, and how she was even alive still, I don't, I don't even know. But the addiction just continued to get worse, and there was times where I'd had enough, she would get... Um, she was the most passive sweetheart, and then when she drank, she was that you know, complete opposite. She would get very belligerent and nasty. Um, she put her hands on me at times, um, blame me, curse me, all kinds of things. Um, I take no joy in telling this story, but that's the reality of what you deal with when you're dealing with somebody that is hurting and wounded yeah. and addicted. Yeah. And, it, and so I had to really pray and choose each time that she would come back to the house, you know, and then it, it would escalate to, yeah. you know, no, you can't be here. Yeah. And the fear of when I have to say, you can't stay here. So where else is she going to go? Back to the old friends? Yeah. Because she certainly at that point wasn't, oh, I want to sign up for, for therapy. I want to sign yeah. up for, like, she was not there. She did not want that. So, it, you know, it was, a, it was a struggle, you know, asking God, where's the, where's the line there? How, do you rescue? Do you, do you, how oh, I pleaded, I begged, I threatened, I, so many stories um, and, and it that seems I tried like, to do to rescue yeah, her. And it seems like, like from that mother, like, even as fathers, like, we want to save our children, and we want yeah. to, and it's like, that, that must have been, as you were talking, Lisa, I could just feel the, the, the heart torn. It's like, I, 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 if, yeah. if, if, if I let her stay, or if I don't let her stay, what's going to happen? And it's like, that's a, that's a mind game, too, as, as the enemy could probably try to play on you. Did you ever hit some moments, Lisa, as you were uh, 
walking through this with her. Uh, I know there was, there was one point where you got a call after midnight and she was drunk and suicidal yeah. and crying. And, and we don't say this to, to devalue Lauren. We saw the beautiful lady that was on that, that picture there. And that's still uh, ingrained in our minds. And it's like, but what you shared is like when somebody goes through trauma, that's why it's so important not to judge people. Yep. Man, I'm going I'm to say that till I get it. It's so important not to judge people. Don't judge people without finding out their story. So easy for us to pass by somebody and look at somebody that's, that's down and out and, and, and we could cast judgment. And, and we're all just one decision away. One thought away. One mistake away. One, one job firing away. One hurt away, one betrayal away from being so hurt to where we need something to go to to pick us up. We're all just one right. step away. Don't, don't ever. And, and I don't know why I got off on that, but I just felt No, need. because Lauren, you know, you brought up a point there. Lauren always smiled. Yeah. You would, if you did not know her story yeah. or, or around her for any period of time, you would not know there was anything wrong. You wouldn't. Because she was just joyful and she didn't bother people with it, but yeah. she was hurting deeply yeah. inside. And yes, there were many times. That, again, this was a ten-year back and Can forth and back and forth. And three with me three months, gone for three months, disappearing for days on end. You don't know yeah. where she's at. But you, you, we got a phone call one night, many times, but this particular night, and she was telling me, "I love you" and goodbye. And Lauren, where are you? 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, you're half asleep, and you learn when the phone rings after midnight, it's, you worry it's that call yeah. that you're going to get. Um, every time you look at the TV and there's a car wreck somewhere, you're, you're looking to see if that's your child's car. Like, it's just, yeah, it messes with you. Yeah. It daily yeah. as a parent, it, 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 it's weary. Yeah. It's very wearying. Um, but that particular night, she called, and I asked her where she was, and she was living on West End off of, what is it, uh, the, the loop there. 440, 440. 440, yeah. She left off West End over there with her friend and her friend's parents. And um, David and I were like, I was like, let's go. She said, I'm not in the house. I, she's going to kill herself. I know she is. And we got in the car mm -hmm. and we drove to that area on West End behind every dumpster. Wow behind the You're looking uh, You're, we're looking yeah. for her wow. because i knew she wasn't in the house went down every street every road uh every grocery store that little that little i don't know what it was it wasn't a 7-eleven but right there at that road at that at her road been in that store that guy knows my name yeah. um and you know uh, she also had she had mentioned there was a wooded area david i think he went down the feeder road of the highway wow. through the woods looking um, everywhere for her because we thought we were going to find her dead. That happened more times than I care to tell. There was one particular time she disappeared for three days. She was staying with me at the time. And you kind of learn. I mean, she was 22 years old. You yeah. can't really say, yeah. but be home at, at yeah. six, yeah. you know, dinner's at six, you know. So she was an adult, but, you know. So I, um, she disappeared for a couple of days and I started to really get worried. And come to find out, she had been going down 440 at 65, 70 miles an hour, going to pick up this friend and fell asleep at the wheel. It was late at night. She offered to be a sweetheart and go pick this girl up from work and fell asleep at the wheel and end over end. When you saw a picture of the car, it was um, as though she, the whole front end was gone. So basically imagine the car started at the uh, windshield mm. because the rest of it was gone. She's in the car, head this way, crushed top. If it had crushed it any further, it would have killed her. And there was like, it was like God put um, his hand, mm. the way the metal was on the inside, there was a cocoon protecting her as she went end over end and uh, ended up in the hospital with a brain bleed, wow. concussion, broken ribs, and... That's where I found her. Are you ready to go get help? Mom, leave me alone. Wow. Mom, leave me alone. So where's God, where's, I, I, God, 
where's God with you in the midst of this, Lisa? Because that's Ooh. a lot that you're going through. Yeah. You're looking for your daughter behind dumpsters and now the car wreck. And, and you're probably feeling the rejection from her. Absolutely. So, so how did God help you not get angry and still be that mother and try to love her through? I got angry. <laughs> I got angry. Uh, I loved her. I hugged her. I yelled at her. I begged her. I did everything a yeah. mother would do. I was furious. I was furious. I was scared is really what I was. I was scared for her. And I, I was praying. And the one thing about God is that I know when you pray and you ask God to heal somebody, I've seen it. I've been one of the recipients yeah. of it. Yeah. I knew. And I trusted him. And I knew. But I had to watch this ugly story in front of my face yeah. for a long time. And yeah, you get angry. Yeah. You get helpless. You get angry. Sometimes you're just like, oh, my God, Lauren, really? You're out to do this? Like, you, I'm not going to lie. You give your hands up sometimes and go, oh, my God, just go do what you're going to do. You're yeah. killing me here. Yeah. Like, you know, I just, I, <laughs> you can't make somebody change. Yeah. You just can't make somebody change until they want to change. It's like you're dying and, on the inside. And I'm dying on the inside watching her go through this. And I'm crying out to God over here. Now, there were many times, I don't know if we're to that point yet, but there were many times where I would pray certain prayers over her and God was absolutely on her tail. You know, many times. I'd yeah. pray God give her dreams, visions, people. She woke up one night in the middle of the night at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm at, the, I'm at my, my kitchen table, and she comes stumbling in going, Ezekiel, where's my Bible? Wow. And I'm like, she's half asleep. Yeah. What is she talking so about? I'm seeing God. I'm seeing God. Move. And she yeah. wanted, she flipped through the Bible. I said, what are you looking for? She goes, can these dry bones come back to life? God was speaking to her in her dreams that, yes, they can. Yes, I can heal you. Wow. So God was talking to her. He'd bring yeah. people in her path, her family in her path. Yeah. He saved her so many times yeah. from wrecks. And, and all the while, I mean, you mentioned this to me. You said uh, you, know, you had prayed nine years. At nine years uh -huh. like, and you just knew, like deep oh, down yeah. inside, you know. And I think this is one of those things where you're really trusting God and believing God. That, and, and you kind of you speak God's word over a situation, and you just knew that you knew. I knew, I knew. That God it was, was like, I was just waiting around. for her to show. It was, uh, it was kind of a joke. I have three, three biological children. It was two down, yeah. one to show. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. the other two are walking and doing what they're supposed yeah, to be doing, but I have one. one to show. And I knew. I knew there was going to be a beautiful bow on this story. I already mapped it out. I let God know what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny, right? Um, that she was going to uh, work through the pain. God was going to heal her of what the root of the problem was. Alcohol was not her problem. It just became a, something that became another, another issue. But the yeah, problem was the broken yeah. heart. Yeah. And so... Um, I knew God was going to heal her, and she, she would be standing up here speaking today instead of me, wow. you know, telling her story. Yeah. And that's what I believed, and I truly, truly believed that was the way that, that was going to end. Wow, wow. So in the midst of that, you're believing. Right. You're seeing some glimpses of God working in Lauren. Mm -hmm. And then take us back to that night, Lisa, where you got that, the, the phone call yeah. that no parent wants to ever get. It's about midnight. And I had just started drifting off to sleep, and I got a phone call from a friend of hers that she lived with, and um, and uh, actually her fiance. And uh, he called and said, "I think Lawrence had a heart attack." Call 911. Already did. Their ambulance are here. I gave her CPR, Lisa. Hey, Lisa, Lauren's gone. Just, no, 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 that's not that bow we talked about, God. Yeah. That's not yeah. that story. And then about 20 minutes later, I called Adonis and woke him up in the middle of the night, yeah. you know, going, pray for me, like I'm about to have to go across town and see my daughter dead in her house, which I did, went across town, did that. Uh, that's a story I wanted to tell about. I'm sitting out in the front yard yeah. um, of her house. And um, they wouldn't let me inside for several hours. You got to remember, this was in October. It was cold. And uh, middle of the night, 
you know, one o'clock in the morning by the time I got there. So somewhere around two or three in the morning, they still wouldn't let me in. And um, they were waiting on the um, detective that uh, didn't want the crime scene or didn't want the scene touched where they found her just in case there was some kind of foul play. They didn't know how she died. We, none of us knew how she died. And other than what Travis had said, which was that I think she might have had a heart attack because uh, she had been complaining about heart palpitations and different things prior to that. Um, so, um, so I'm standing in the front yard waiting my turn to go see my daughter and uh, crying. Uh, just that's within that first a couple of hours where you're just, oh my God, gut wrenching. And you're, cry you're crying, you're crying out to God, you're sh shock, disbelief, all of those stages of grief. And I, it was pitch dark and the, and the moon was lighting the sky. And I looked up and I saw Lauren. I don't get visions, I get words from God. He uses words in movies and books with me, not visions. This was, a, this was a vision. And it was my daughter from the waist up in a shirt that I'm very familiar with that she wore all the time. Hair was down, she was smiling. And it was almost like the matrix, kind of like that, yeah. that wavy, like dimensional or whatever. And I saw her and she spoke to me and she said, I love you, mom. I'm okay. Wow. It's going to be okay. Wow. And instantly she just smiled and then she was gone. And then peace just hit me. Like, I don't even know how to describe, you know, there's the peace that passes understanding. Yes, we all quote yes. that scripture, and we've all experienced that. Well, this was on a way this different level, way different level. Um, grieving, still upset about the situation, but peace. And then, of course, I go in and I see her. I remember grabbing her phone for whatever reason, I found out later, grabbing her phone and a few of her things as they had her on a gurney and put her in... <laughs> It's surreal, an ambulance, yeah. and then there goes my child down the street, and I'm just four o'clock in the morning, headed back to my house, and um, oh, I wanted to mention when Lauren died, I had two other children. Well, it, it, David and I have children that we share, but my two biological children. Um, when I called them to tell them, I couldn't reach Jesse for quite a while. Um, but it finally did. And then I called Joshua, who then, at that moment, um, I, I told him, and then he excused himself. He was in Crown College in Minnesota. And um, I find out later that he had um, went down to the lake. And he immediately, when I told him his sister had died, God brought up something that had happened uh, nine years prior, and it was a vow that he had made to God. And I think it kind of sums up where our whole family, including myself, was with this, that he went down to the lake and that he had vowed to God nine years prior, and let me backtrack just for half, 30 seconds. I yeah. won't go too far. No, 30 can't. seconds here. One of the, the times that I was talking about how God was answering prayer, yeah. you know, and I'm still seeing her, still wanting to drink, and still being around these friends and all of this. She was at my home. She was living with me at the time, <clears throat> and I knew she was drinking in her bedroom, and I got really worried about her. She just kept drinking that whole day, and I was really, really worried about her, and I was knocking on the door. She wasn't answering me, and I tried to open the door. She wasn't, wouldn't, the door was locked. And I really started praying, an intercessory kind of prayer, just really a gut-wrenching prayer. And I called Joshua, who was in Texas at the time, and um, he said, basically, hi, Mom, what's up? And, I, he, 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 and he asked me, is there something wrong with Lauren? Lauren called me a couple of hours ago, and I went, oh, really? I'm, remember, I'm sitting on the couch. Here's the, the door right here to her bedroom. So I'm right here with her. He's, he's long distance. He said, Lauren called me a couple of hours ago and told me I love you and goodbye. Wow. And I had been on my face, you know, the gut-wrenching snot, you know, yeah. eye water and, yeah. you know, gut-wrenching prayer over her. And at the end of the prayer, I, God gave him a scripture. And it was Psalm 56, 12 and 13. Vows made to you are binding on me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, and you have kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. 
And what he meant was that he vowed right then and there at the end of that prayer, I don't know what's going on with my sister. If she's dead, if she's alive, I know she's in your hands and I am letting her go into your hands. Fast forward, she didn't die that night. Yeah. <clears throat> but God, look how God was doing things. Yeah. You know, like both of us were on the same page in two different states. Yeah. So the night whenever I told him, uh, he said he immediately that scripture came back that he had promised he would get on his face before the Lord and worship him no matter the wow. outcome. And he That's went down right. to the lake, got on his face, and did that. And he said at the end of that, God gave him a peace that allowed him to walk through the rest of burying her and all of that. And I can say that's my son's portion of the story, yeah. but it's also mine too. Sure, it's it's mine too, yeah. because we all had to give her up. Like we all had to let her go. And, yeah. and it was a process for 10 years of letting yeah. her go. Yeah. You, know, you, you, know. you mentioned something, you said, you know, we quote that scripture that, that he'll give you peace that passes all understanding, but it's one thing to live through that in the, in the, right. in the situation that you were in. Right. And, you know, receiving the phone call, seeing your daughter, uh, has passed away and going through a plethora of different emotions and at the end of that you got that glimpse of that peace that passes all understanding right. uh, but then you still had to keep walking through some stuff yeah i still said. had to go go to a funeral home and yeah, pick out a casket you still have for to my walk, child walk through my a lot of stuff my 28 year old child and you know that was that was yeah. hard yeah and then you know Take us on that journey of the plethora of emotions because there was some, the thing about Lisa, I, like, like she, uh, she has, she talks to God like I talk, sometimes I talk to God like I'm crazy, like, yeah. like God, and so I know Lisa has those kind of conversations with God, but take oh, us on that, 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 that mother conversation, conversation that you had with God, yeah. like, wait a minute, God, right? because Three you days. were trusting for nine years right. that he was going to turn this around. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said this earlier in this service. I said, God, hmm. God never says that we'll never go through anything. But he sent his son to promise us that he'll walk through us with it all. And that's the thing about our Christian faith and our hope. Don't get caught up in the trial. Trials are going to come. We're going to go through those. But, but hold on to the promise that God said that I'll be with you and I'll stick closer than any brother. And in the midst of that, I think when you've got somebody that close to you, then, then he allows you to have those kind of talks to yes. him. And I think God meets us right, right where, where we are. we are because we all face things on a different level, if that makes sense. And I think, Lisa, as you dove into this conversation that you're going to share with us, that God met you where you were. He was. He did. As, as you had those conversations after Lauren died, and you, you began to say, God, why this? And I'm never going to see this. And yeah, yeah. It was a conversation. It was a couple of days after she died. And, you know, you're busy doing funeral arrangements and family coming in, the beautiful people that, that showed up and supported us and all of that. And I was just doing my conversation with God like I always do. And y'all forgive me, but, well, now I don't even need to say that. I just talk to God real. Yeah. And sometimes it gets ugly. <laughs> it just does. Sometimes it does. And sometimes he talks to me back with my own voice using that same sarcastic tone. And it's really kind of funny. But I was talking to God, and I was crying. And I was just like, Daddy God, she's never going to. I was at the point where I was grieving what, the, 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 there's never going to be this and that and whatever. Yeah. in her life. Yeah. She's never going to be a bride. She wanted to be married so bad. She's never going to be a bride, God. She's just, she's never going to wear the veil. I'm not going to get to go pick out the dress for her and with her and all of this and blah, blah, blah. And I was whining and God said, she's the bride of Christ. She's right here with me, fully clothed in the robe of righteousness. And that is a beautiful wedding gown. Wow. Well, well, she's never going to have kids. She's never going to have kids. What I didn't mention was six months before she died, Lauren got pregnant. And eight weeks in, she lost her baby. Mm. Sent her further into the plunge. But it also, she had started at that point, a little sidebar here, started coming around the family more because she had been staying away. She didn't want, the, people with addictions and doing things, they don't want people to see that. They want to be around the people that are okay with what they're doing. Mama, you don't love me. These people love me. Wow. 
Yeah, really? They love you so much, they pour vodka down your throat. Yeah, they love you so much. No, your family loves you. The truth is this. And so we kind of had to go through that situation, and that, that, that hurt with that. But um, back to what I was saying, uh, Lord, she's never going to have a child. Yeah. Well, Lisa, actually, yes, she already has one, and that child's right here with me and with her. You're just going to have to wait a few minutes before you get to see wow. that baby, your grandbaby. Wow. Well, but, but, and the list kept going on and on. And, but I thought you were going to heal her. I thought you, the minute she stepped into glory, I healed her completely. More healing than you could have ever prayed for her to have down here. She's with me. She's whole and healthy. Yeah, yeah. Well, God, you've got an answer for everything. He that's does. A, that's <laughs> what I said to him. And you know what he said back to me? I do. Yeah. I do. I do. I do. And I love that because, you know, it, it kind of reminds me because I know you can have a, a lot of people have different thoughts and opinions. And I think even some of your family member were, were like, well, where is she right now? You right. know, And so people can get caught up in that. But it re reminds me, as you were talking about Lauren, it did remind me of, of the thief on the cross mm -hmm. who, who in that moment, obviously he had done something wrong to allow him to be, to be crucified along with Jesus. But in that moment, he was the one that spoke up and said, and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's almost like he's saying, I, I believe you right. are who you say you are. And Jesus didn't consult anybody, but he looked at him and said, there this were day, some people are... you're going to be with me in paradise. Right. And, and I think, you know, I, you, I just, I just, I think God can do whatever he wants to do. That's, that's my thought with that. And I know, you know, that could blow a lot of theology, uh, wreck a lot of theology, mm -hmm. but, but the thief on the cross, he didn't go to one Bible study. He, I, we don't even know if he went to a church service. Steve, we don't even know if he said the sinner's prayer. Right. Because I think Jesus said, if you believe, yeah, right? Yeah, that's it. You believe, right? And Is the blood enough or not? And so I think with that, Lisa, I think God was, was speaking to you right where you were. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those things. It's, it's a trust God. You know, it's like you don't need man's opinion or approval. It's like God is speaking to you and showing you and telling you, hey, your daughter's okay. with me. She's, She's okay. okay. She's good. She's with me. And there were people that, and I don't want to linger there, but yeah. there were people that, were, that, that had a concern. My, my own son yeah. was like, you know, like they're, they're Christians. They've been reading yeah. the word all their life, and they're... They watched their sister get saved, love the Lord, and then walk really sideways. That's what I call it, you know, sideways uh, for quite a long time. And, well, I mean, how can, how can you be saved and know Jesus yeah. and do that? But a broken heart can lead you there. Yeah. And I asked God yeah. straight up. You know, this beautiful bow that I wanted God to tie, you know, with her story where she's standing up here today talking about how she got healed and, and, and all of that and that didn't happen, that's not happening yeah. today. God, w w what is her life and story? What is it? Yeah. And he gave me one word, and he said grace. Wow. wow. Unmerited grace. favor. Grace. Because what she couldn't do for herself, he did on the cross for her. She was covered. She was covered. Jesus' blood covered. So for those of you out there that are struggling, for those of you people that are hurting, you parents that are worried and hurting over your children or somebody that's listening maybe that has an addiction right now or maybe they've been sexually abused or their spouse might have left them or died and you're grieving right now, and you're wondering how Jesus is going to get you through that, the blood will cover you. Yes. We'll cover your child. We'll cover you, and we'll be there for you through this entire time. And, and it, the story didn't end the way I wanted it to. Yeah. Six weeks, um, about six weeks after she died was when we were supposed to hear about the autopsy report mm -hmm. to find out what really killed her. Meanwhile... That cell phone that I took out of her bedroom, yeah, I started reading that and saw every one of the drug dealers, prescriptions from doctors filled like once a week, yeah. like from people that were giving her. So I saw this journey and I saw the person, uh, that's when I realized that her friend had given her that 
what was supposed to have been that night, we found out later, was supposed to have been an Oxycontin. Lauren was sick, she was at home, it was a Friday night, and she had had some vodka and smoked a joint, took a shower and was laying in bed. And got a text from a friend that said, I'm about to go over to so-and-so's house and get an oxy. Do you want me to bring you one? Well, okay. Minding our own business on this deal. And as it turns out, um, and I'm leading into the, to the yeah, other story right there, yeah. but... Um, I had to, uh, it, it, during the six week period of time from the time that she died to the time that we got the autopsy report, I had to deal with, you know, some of these folks that she had been living with and her friend that I, I found out later gave her the, gave her the Oxycontin. That took her life. That ended up taking her life because yeah. it wasn't Oxy, it was fentanyl. Yeah. Wow. So, so Lisa, right there, not to cut you off, but right yeah. there. So God had already taken you through this, hey Lisa, she's with me. Yeah. Her child's with me. She's good. The grace has covered. She's with me. But then you had to work through something yes. as a mother. Yes. And, and, and I think we've all hit some moments in our life. Has anybody ever blamed somebody mm. for your misery? Like everybody looking at us like they're all sanctified. But, oh, okay. but I know there are some people in it <laughs> that I, you've blamed people for a situation yeah. that you've been in. We've all been there. Oh, yeah. And so, Lisa, there you were. You, you've, got, you've got the text messages. You know the friend that, uh, that gave, gave her that. Mm -hmm. And so what kind, of, what kind of emotions were going through you, Lisa, uh, the mm -hmm. real, the raw, yeah. as I, you know. I wanted to kill her. There you go. At, at the end of the day, you know. And, and you know. Uh, now, I had a conversation with God, but before I go there, I, I do want to say this other thing because it was beautiful, and it, it leads into this. A couple of weeks after um, she died, I was at her gravesite, and I was standing there talking to her, and I remember just crying, saying, it just wasn't supposed to end this way. It was not yeah. supposed to end like this. Joseph, there's that... Um, that oh, you didn't get it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> And I heard my daughter speak to me. It was her voice. Just instantly and said, Mama, it's not over for me. It's just beginning. And instantly God gave me a heavenly perspective yeah. that basically has saved my life yeah. from then forward. My, my mental. Yeah. Let, let yeah. me the say my heart. Perspective. My, the heavenly through. perspective. To, we have to, you know, the show is not down here. Yeah, we live here for 50, 60, 80 years, yeah. whatever. That's eternity, yeah. right? And and we're preparing to go there, but that's the show. And my daughter was telling me, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Probably doesn't have a second thought about us down here. Yeah. Like, she's good. She's sliding on a rainbow. We tease, you know, she's petting a lion. She's doing all those things that Lauren would do. And uh, she's fine. It's us down here. Because I was the one left with the broken heart. I was the one wanting to kill somebody. I was the one wanting to... Ask God why. Yeah. Not why because I blamed him. Yeah. Because I never blamed God through this. Lauren made her own choices. Lauren chose to do that. You know what I mean? Like, she chose to take the pill. I, I couldn't blame other people. Yeah. But I began blaming maybe family members yeah. that hurt her. Because you start going down that rabbit trail. Well, if yeah. this person wouldn't have done yeah. this and this and this, she would have never got to here, to here, to whatever. Maybe if I would have tried a little bit harder to try, try to save her. Maybe, and, and I struggled through that that first year. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I beat myself up. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the bargaining stage of grief. The if yeah. I would have, could have, should have. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know and like, oh, if I would have went one more time. Yeah. Uh, Look, I almost died trying to save her. I almost got yeah. ran over by a car with one of her friends one time. Like, I... There wasn't anything. And you know what? I'm not God for her. Yeah. It wasn't my job to save her. Yeah. It's my job to love her. To love her. And to pray it's for her. Lisa. It wasn't my it, job to save her. It's my job to love it her. It was my job to yeah. love her. And the best that I possibly could. So anyway, at this point, I had just found out yeah. that she died of a fentanyl overdose. From the pill that yeah. somebody else gave her. And I'm sorry. I was a little mad at her. Yeah. A little mad at that girl. Um, but I knew, and I even remember saying, yeah. God, I know it was Lauren's choice to do that. It was her choice yeah. to be around, Still, but, but mom, I was like, yeah. dad, come, yeah. you know, yeah. okay. she lives. I like, I yeah, yeah. Go, yeah. so I'm having so a conversation. How did, how did God deal with you in that? Because this has gone from, yeah. from God has shown you once again, he's Lauren's good. He's got right. your daughter, 
But now it's like the enemy's trying to me? take you out. Right. Now it's like, because that could be a root of bitterness and yes. anger. Yes, that's why. So what was that conversation like? And we'll, we'll close with okay. this because I believe this was, this was for you, Lisa. This yes. was a part because it's like we can get so stuck caught up in blaming somebody and would never really seeing it through, like you said, the perspective of heaven. So I think right. God did something in he you. He did. I, I walked into the kitchen. This was six weeks later. Got the autopsy report. Police said they weren't going to do anything because back in 2016 when this happened, it was kind of the, the, the whole fentanyl thing was just kind of becoming um, aware in the news, on the scene. And it was kind of the mentality, honestly, was you, you play, you pay. And they weren't going to do anything. And I was angry because somebody can't just kill Lauren. And there's no consequences for anything. You can just kill a life. No, no consequences. I was pretty angry about it. So I walked into the kitchen. I was starting to have a conversation with God about injustice. That's why I read in Isaiah right here, I am a God, the Lord who loves justice. Well, God was about to show me that. I started talking to him and I said, Lord, I said, this is not fair. It's unjust. What about justice? I know this isn't your fault, God. I know Lauren made her own choices. I wasn't blaming him. And I was like, God, but this girl, come on. Like, nothing. They're not going to do anything. And I heard the Lord say to me one of the heaviest things probably ever that hit my heart so hard. And he said, what do you want me to do to her? I'll do it. What do you want me to do to the person that you're saying killed your daughter? Well, Lauren took the pill, but you, yeah. you understand what I'm saying. Put it in her hands. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. And as you can imagine, thoughts immediately went through my mind, and it went, I'm going to tell you the truth. It went kind of something like this. Oh, yeah. It kind of went something like this. The thoughts in my mind, um, kill her, God, just kill her. No, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relive this for you. This is my thought. Okay. Uh, no, can't do that. You're God. You're not going to kill somebody. Okay. Well, beat her up really good. I mean, really give it to her. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that'll make me feel better. No, no, that's not the answer. Okay, you could put her in jail for, what do they call it? Uh, not, not murder, but it's... it's um, like, uh, yeah, yeah, like involuntary manslaughter or something like that. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, she's got a four-year-old. And uh, he would lose his mother. How was that going to help? Okay. And I got really cry, and um, I remember crying. I just started crying. And I just broke. And I said, God, all right. I know what I'm, I'm going to ask you for this. I want you to save her soul because she's just as wounded as Lauren was because it could have easily, the truth is, Lauren could have been the one who gave her the pill that night and she's the one dead and Lauren's still walking around because that's the truth. And God, while you're at it, I'm sure she's going to have guilt the rest of her life thinking she killed her best friend. So can you take that away from her while you heal her? Because she needs you. And Lauren, one more little last thing. Can you make something beautiful out of this? I'll even stand up on a stage next to this girl after you heal her and tell the story with her about how God healed both of our hearts and, and, and set my heart free because God, I know. And at that point, God started reminding me of a journey I had been on before where I had gotten very bitter at somebody for hurting me. And for decades, I stayed angry and bitter. And let me tell you, that scripture that says, if you have an issue, I'm going to paraphrase, okay? Yeah. You Bible, Bible scholars, don't jump on me. Um, if you have an issue with somebody, you go to them immediately. And he even says quickly and make things right. Why? Because the enemy will try to put a foothold, a wedge, not only just between you and that person, but in your heart. It's called a root of bitterness. Yeah. And you get in that root of bitterness and anger, it will lock you up. It locked me up for about a decade yeah. in the past. So I already have smelled that yeah. horrible situation of being in that. And I knew I had to immediately, I had to forgive her. I had to forgive her right then and there. Because it's the right thing to do. But because for my own sanity, yeah. my heart, yeah. my mind, I had to forgive her. Because I don't think God would have... 
it had just made it worse. Yeah. I mean, you know. And, and I think God was setting you up to ask you that yeah. kind of question. It's like yeah. God, God was like tricking you into realizing, no, wait a minute. You've got to see this from a heavenly perspective. And that's not easy to do, Lisa. This is, this is you know, because we're human, we live in this earth suit. And it makes our flesh feel good to blame somebody and blame. And then all of a sudden, it's like God is trying to, God is, God is still allowing grace to cover you as well. So that as a mom, because let I me mean, know the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Absolutely. And he'll keep that on a domino effect. And he was after you now, Lisa. Right. And then God came along. Hey, what do you want me to do to this girl? This is yeah. like the perfect setup question. Right. And then at the end of it, it's like, I believe the spirit of God was moving on you. And healing you through the words you're speaking, God, no, save her soul. Heal her. Restore her. Keep her from guilt and shame. And, and in the midst of that, I think as God was setting you free and empowering you, I think it empowers you to be able to sit on the stage and tell your story. Absolutely. From a pure heart. And, from a, from, and, and it's not just a one and done. And I believe this is a journey that God continues to walk with you, right. Lisa. Absolutely. Um, even though it's been several years since Lauren has passed, it's a daily journey as you're walking through this. And it is. Grief, it, grief takes yes, time. Yes. You know, that first year was rough. Second yeah. year was way, way, way better. Um, I had to get over, one of the hurdles was getting over the if I would have, could have, should have. What yeah. else could I have done? Yeah. And I had to let that go. But one of the things I will tell you, and God made me look good. I didn't do it. I know who I am. <laughs> you know, on a bad day, you know. Yeah. Um, but one thing we determined, I determined, and then as a family we determined, we were going to trust God. Trust God. What, what else you got? Yeah. When you're in the middle of the ditch yeah. right there, you've got you're a trusting. dead child, you're and you're watching your other children yeah. all grieving. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. Like Job's friend. It reminds me of his friend, oh, curse God and die. Oh, what, die. how's that going to help? How's that going to yeah. help? You need him. Yeah. He's our father. Yeah. He loves us. He cares about what we're going through. He does. And I will tell you that I've trusted the Lord, and I have watched him heal our family mm. i have watched him bring a joy to our family wow. even after this little 30 seconds i yeah. got a little so shout yeah. out yeah. my daughter had been trying to have a child for 10 years and and nothing seven months after lauren died she gets pregnant and nine months later we got little james yeah. and what a joy and then yeah. and then a year and a half later here comes a little lily um and i, I the joy that God brought in those children and brought to my, um, my daughter who, you know, she lost her sister. Yeah. And then all of a sudden God answers a prayer, not seven months later, yeah. uh, that she's going to have a baby. And, and my son, the same thing. Like, a, a, our family isn't perfect. And if you get me talking about it for too long, <laughs> I still might want to slap somebody. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lie. Like, that was a dumb thing to do. Yeah. Like, why'd they do that to my daughter? Uh, but I have to stay on the good side of the thoughts. Yeah. You know, you have, to, you have to control your thoughts. Yeah. And, and eventually, little by little over time, the darts stopped coming. You know, and, and you learn how to walk in that just really letting it go. The, the whole letting go process of grieving, of letting my child go and um, believing, and I still believe, that God is going to make that bow yeah. even bigger. It's yeah. bigger because she's, she's healed. She's not yeah. worried about this. Amen. But that God would use my mouth and our family's mouth to speak truth that hopefully somebody yeah. would find something beautiful out of this. Last thing I want to say, I want to thank and I think it's important, the community of people that were around us at the time when Lauren died. Yeah. Jennifer Ranson and all her prayers as she walked through through this, you and Heather. Um, Randy and Sylvia Blue walked into my house at 6 o'clock in the morning. And Randy's wisdom, what do you need prayer for? I said, bargaining stage of grief because the enemy's going to try to kick me in the teeth with those thoughts. Yeah. And they prayed over me and they stayed with me. Yeah. Mike and Tina Kyle. Yeah. Um, there's... It, it, my 30-year longtime friends, Deborah Tebow and Leslie Stinchfield, who both had lost children within five years before me and laid on that bed with me as I bawled my guts out. Yeah. And they were examples of how to walk through this. Yeah. And they challenged me. Yeah. 
Are you going to walk through this and trust God and let him make something beautiful out of this? And so where you can be whole and healthy and happy and have joy, or are you going to wallow in, you know, misery and, and blaming and all those things that can trip you up? And they encourage me. So I encourage anybody out there that's, that it might not even be the same circumstance, but you can have joy again. You can have life again. You can overcome because the spirit of the Lord God is upon him because he wants to proclaim good news to the broken and that God can heal you and Lauren's not healed here on this stage but she's healed on the other stage and I want to thank God love you Lauren yeah, yeah. guys put the picture of Lauren back up there give Lisa a hand clap Lisa thank you so much for, for sharing your story and, and, and right before we go because I believe you know the Spirit is on you. I want you to, uh, if we could all stand, we're going to yeah. be ready to be this. They're going to lead us into another worship song. We're going to wrap this thing up in, in some, some worship, a good worship moment. But Lisa, I want you to pray. I want you to look into that camera uh, right back there. there. And I want you to pray. A specific prayer for parents that could be watching that are going through a similar situation. I want you to pray over them as God leads you. And then we'll enter into a time of worship. Father, I ask that you step into the room of each and every person who's watching your child turn into something they don't know. The fear that they have, God. The worry. The what do I do, God. Or maybe they don't even know you, God. And I ask that you just step right in there just strongly by your spirit, God, that you would meet each and every need that they have, that you would give them wisdom to know how to handle this situation, that you would just cover them with your peace, God, that passes all understanding. God, that you would fill them with hope where they maybe have lost hope, that you would, you would rise them up to be, raise those parents up with, with strength to trust you through this, God, and give them, give them the ability to let their children go into your hands. Let them go into your hands and just listen and walk with you, God, as you deal with their children. Give them the courage to be able to walk this road, God. Many, many long nights, God knows, God sees you. The long nights, the waiting, the wondering, the fear. Am I gonna get that call? But know this, God is bigger than that call. God is bigger than anything your child's doing. And I just, right now, I just bind the enemy off of addiction, off of, off of the spirit of death, of trying to kill people through lies. And God, I just ask that your spirit would fill these folks with hope. And that God, that their story your story, God, that you're writing in their lives would be something beautiful, that there is a hope and a future at the end. And I just thank you, God, in Jesus' name.